diabetic retinopathy. Another clinical feature is soft exudates which are nothing but cottonwool spots. These represent the infarction of the nerve fiber layer of the retina. The site of cottonwool spots and the flame shaped hemorrhages is just the same layer that is the nerve fiber layer of retina. These appear as fluffy white and they do have irregular borders and uh, they do have striations of the nerve fiber layer. When we compare the soft exudates and the hard exudates, the hard exudates are the lipids which leak and they are very refractile and they are quite deep and they are small and they do have well defined borders. Whereas the cottonwool spots, they are larger, irregular, superficial in their position. What constitutes this proliferative diabetic retinopathy is uh, new vessels at the disc, that is the optic disc, or the new vessels elsewhere, NVE, preretinal or vitreous hemorrhage. Preretinal hemorrhage is hemorrhage present between the vitreous and the retina. And any preretinal fibrosis or tractional retinal detachment constitutes proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Again, this slide shows the new vessels at the optic disc or elsewhere. The nature tries to produce these new vessels in order to supply good nutrition to the retina. Once there is an ischemia, there is new vascularization. And these new vessels are not good enough to provide the circulation. On the other hand, they tend to cause bleeding, leading to vitreous hemorrhage and tractional retinal detachment and loss of vision. So these new vessels are not good enough to provide any nutrition. What is the relation between hypertension and uh, diabetic retinopathy? As we all know, all these are vascular disorders. The major landmark study is the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial DCCT in type 1 diabetics and uh, UKPDS, that is United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study with the large randomized clinical trials which showed a definite reduction in the risk of progression of diabetic retinopathy as well as the other complications related to diabetes by reducing the blood pressure. So the reduction of blood pressure is a very very important part of management of diabetic retinopathy. What are the different treatment options we have macul for macular edema? The most important part of the treatment for diabetic macular edema is one is good control of diabetes, good control of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cessation of smoking, control of anemia and all other risk factors which tend to cause worsening of retinopathy. And uh, the treatment for macular edema itself can be either with the use of anti-VEGF injections, which are anti-vascular endothelial derived growth factors like bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflibercept, and the other treatment options are retina lasers or intravitreal steroid injections. So. The treatment option depends on the severity of the macular edema and the vision of the patient. If the vision is good and the macular edema is very mild, the patients can be encouraged to have a good control of diabetes and the macular edema may improve on its own. What is the role of laser in diabetic macular edema? It is very important to understand the laser does not help to improve the vision but it tries to stabilize the vision and prevents the risk of vision going worse. Whereas in case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the pan-retinal photocoagulation is a very, very important treatment option and it has been shown to reduce the risk of blindness in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The steroids, again, because of their anti 
inflammatory effects have shown to reduce the macular edema and these steroids is generally considered the second or third line of treatment in management of diabetic macular edema so in summary the management of diabetic retinopathy involves most importantly control of diabetes and other risk factors get the help of the physicians or endocrinologist in control of diabetes and other risk factors if the patient has got proliferative diabetic retinopathy pan retinal photocoagulation is the treatment of choice if there is a macular edema involving the center that is fovea then anti vegf intravitreal injections is the treatment option if the macular edema is not involving the fovea then laser either focal macular laser or macular grade laser is an option if the patient is not responding to the intravitreal anti vegf injections or lasers intravitreal steroids can be considered vitrectomy is reserved for patients who have got non clearing vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment so what is the take home message of this presentation it feels really nice to know that the diabetic retinopathy has been replaced by the genetic disorders as the leading cause of blindness in developed countries uh, but still in developing countries uh, cataract glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy remains major cause of blindness regular monitoring of diabetic retinopathy is as important as important as monitoring the control of diabetes loss of vision in diabetic retinopathy is a very late manifestation and it is important to remember at every stage we can do something to improve or preserve the vision remember presence of retinopathy doesn't mean it needs treatment everyone with retinopathy needs monitoring and in about one third of the patients the diabetic retinopathy improves with good control of diabetes and other risk factors what do we do when a patient complains of blurring of vision the most important thing uh, is to ask for the history of floaters or any shadows if patient has noticed recently if the patient complains of new onset floaters and is a known diabetic then you should always suspect vitreous hemorrhage which is a sign of proliferative diabetic retinopathy it is very important to check for perception of light and projection of rays from different quadrants to rule out any retinal detachment in a patient who has lost vision always try to record the vision on a snellens chart to assess how blurred is the vision always remember to do a dilated fundus examination in diabetic retinopathy patients how often do we need to see the diabetic retinopathy patients a patient who is diagnosed as proliferative diabetic retinopathy on the retinal screening should be seen by the ophthalmologist within 2 weeks and a patient with diabetic maculopathy can be seen up to within 13 weeks as per the uk diabetic retinal screening services protocol i hope you liked the presentation on diabetic retinopathy we do look forward for your feedback on the presentation and